space. We're enormously grateful to everyone who's made this possible. In order to thank them all, we are going to have a special reception another time um, with, with food and, and all in an afternoon or evening uh, thing. For right now, I'm not going to say much about that, except to mention the people who've been working so hard in recent weeks. Kathy, you know Kathy, wave your hand to everybody. So, and and Jack, Jackie and Lenora, and Jackie and Lenora and Suhail are the staff of our center, and they have created this space and done the move, and they're still kind of smiling and standing, which is absolutely amazing. More formal thanks to them and everyone later. This space, we decided at the very origins of our center that souls and the center needed more and better seminar space. Instead of making this all faculty offices, we decided to allocate this for seminar space, and I think it's going to make a world of a difference for our center and for souls and for others who make use of this space. I'd like to go on about many other things, but I'm not going to because I want our special guest today to have as much time as possible. There couldn't be anyone more appropriate, and it's really good luck that the space is just barely finished and we scheduled him for this date months ago. Steve Stearns, I'm gonna call him, I hope he won't, He's the real big kahuna uh, for evolutionary medicine. Uh, he's a Hawaiian native who really, uh, we would not be here today if it wasn't for Steve's foresight and initiative and connections and smarts to get this all going. Shortly after the publication of Why We Got Sick, he, I got this invitation from this fellow I didn't know very well saying, I'm organizing a conference in Sion, Switzerland. And it turns out that's where I finally met the biologist that I grow to love over the next decades. Um, and that meeting was a model for good meetings because he had insisted that we talked. John Maynard Smith sat down with us and wrote the chapter that he's just a model for good, doing good science. That became volume one of the large edited volume. That's get into a second edition. Steve also has a textbook on evolution and a new textbook on evolutionary medicine, which sets the standards for the field. Plus, he edits the journal for the field. And this whole field just would not exist without his foresight and intelligence, and we're so grateful to him. I'm not going to say too many more nice things about him. I want him to have a little bit of time to talk, so I'm going to do that. Steve, trade-offs are the center of everything, right? Welcome. Randy, the good psychiatrist that he is, has induced in me a state of high performance anxiety. So, <laughs> Back in the day, 45 years ago, when I was getting into life history evolution, trade-offs were the central concept, and without them it would not be possible to do optimality theory on life histories. Uh, and at that time, their definition was left productively ambiguous. And essentially, a trade-off was conceived of, at that point, as any linkage between traits that constrain the simultaneous evolution of two or more traits. Okay, so that was just the idea that organisms are integrated and evolutionary changes in one trait will have consequences for others. Since then, um, Many, since then, many of the concepts that were developed in the context of life history evolution and other aspects of phenotypic evolution have started to penetrate other fields, trade-offs in particular. And they've been used in many different senses. I've accompanied some of that. I've observed some of it from a distance. And um, now, 45 years later, I'm revisiting it uh, from the point of view of someone who is both concerned and a little bit puzzled about something that I thought I knew very well. In order to carry out this task, uh, I have started a graduate course on trade-offs, and we're in the middle of the semester on it, and so basically what you're getting is a progress report. It's an intermediate report. So here's the frame for my talk. I'm first going to thank my collaborators. My motivation is actually really two things. One is I want to show you some new results that are relevant to evolutionary medicine. But then I want to mainly discuss what we don't yet know about trade-offs and why that's interesting. I'll give a little bit of background on classical views of trade-offs and the evolution of aging just to get everybody on board. Then I'm going to step through several examples of how trade-offs are conceptualized and measured. And I want to give you a heads up that when I go through that, 
I'm going to be dealing in a few minutes with studies for each of which I could give an hour-long talk. And my purpose is not actually to drive home the deep message of that study, but just to say, this is how the concept of trade-off was used in this context, and I'm going to flip through those, okay? I hope you don't find that too confusing, because I'm going to flip through about seven different ways of thinking about what a trade-off is. Then I'll raise a few general questions that are prompted by these examples. And that's just really for intellectual fun. That's not to say that those are necessarily things you could do good science with, but they're certainly interesting things to think about. And then I'm going to suggest a couple of ideas about the research that might need to be done next. And I'm thinking about that both from the point of view of basic research and from the point of view of medicine. <coughs> so my collaborators, I've done a lot of these things with Sean Byers, who was my postdoc at Yale, and then he went to Copenhagen and then back to Australia, where he's now working with Michael Lenoyer. Uh, then in Copenhagen, uh, Sean worked with Koch Bumsma, and uh, that's how I got plugged into the Danish database. You're going to see some results from that. Uh, the cost of reproduction in Framingham, I did mostly operating out of Yale with Susan Wong, who is now uh, come back to Yale. She was getting her PhD then, and she's now back in the stats department and with Sean. Then some older work, correlated responses to selection in fruit flies, I did in Basel and also in collaboration with Linda Partridge, Kuki Bilsma, and Mike Rose. So I had a lot of people that I was working with. So my motivation. Well, trade-offs are caused by diverse mechanisms and at several different levels of the biological hierarchy. And we have to draw distinctions among these if we're going to understand the consequences of perturbing them. And we do that every time we treat a patient, we perturb a trade-off. Okay? So this is now getting out of the realm of theoretical evolution and theoretical ecology and into the, realm, the practical realm where decisions have consequences in terms of suffering and lives. And so it involves us in a different kind of biology to go to that level. So do all such perturbations lead to responses on the same time scale? Well, probably not all trade-off mechanisms do. Are they all equally difficult to weaken or to break? Well, probably not. If we characterize their differences carefully, would we be likely to discover interesting <coughs> new biology? Well, probably yes. Every time we've tried that, we usually do. Do the different ways we use to measure trade-offs lead to biases in our perception of their strength and importance? Well, probably yes. That's a characteristic of most measurement. Do the different mechanisms that cause them vary in their potential for producing unintended <coughs> consequences when we perturb them? Probably yes. So you'll see there's something going on here. Probably, probably, probably. Basically, I'm just saying our job is not yet done, and that's why I wanted to motivate the talk with that slide. So trade-offs require two connections. One is a connection between two or more traits, and the other is a connection between those traits and fitness. Either could be positive or negative. However, a trade-off will only exist when a change in one trait that increases fitness is associated with a change in another trait that decreases fitness. So that's the evolutionary definition of a trade-off. And that's the initial one from which uh, the concept spread. And in other fields, it's not so di directly connected to fitness. People use it in many different senses. One classical way of thinking about a trade-off is that you have a pipe that is filled with energy or materials that you are acquiring. It has a certain diameter. And then there is kind of a zero-sum game allocation. This is called a Y allocation. And some of it goes into one function, and another of it goes into another function. Maybe some into fecundity, and some into survival, or whatever. So this is now a paradigm in the field of people who study trade-offs. They call it the Y allocation model. And the important thing to realize is that it's fundamentally physiological and it's describing a process that's going on inside a single individual. 
However, trade-offs can also occur among the members of a family or a population. I'll go in a little bit later to population-level trade-offs. So, for example, just to, to run through a few evocative examples, in kestrels, clutch size is trading off with age of maturity and clutch size of offspring. So things that happen are happening in parents are having consequences in offspring. In Drosophila, old females lay eggs that have higher juvenile mortality than do eggs laid by young females. So you can start to see that there's kind of a maternal effect reaction norm in terms of juvenile mortality. One that Tim Clutton Brock discovered is that in red deer, the effect on the mortality of the mother is greater if she has a daughter than if she has a son because the son moves away sooner and the daughter stays and competes for food with the mother. So this is a mechanism at the ecological level and it also has to do with which sex disperses. In general, Trade-offs can occur within any set of interacting individuals whose interactions determine fitness, right up to the population level. One of the issues we'll probably confront or that you'll start to think about is do we actually then need different labels for these different kinds of things and would that clarify our thinking? Maybe we can go back to that in the dis discussion if we have time. I also need to give you a little bit of background on the evolution of aging. I'm trying to just make sure that everybody gets up to speed on the things I'm talking about. Some of you are experts in this. Aging is the decrease with age in intrinsic ability to survive and reproduce. And it's a byproduct for selection for reproductive performance. It explains our susceptibility to degenerative disease and it explains why we must die. So certainly this has got to be one of the big take home messages of evolutionary biology for everybody. And all organisms that have asymmetric reproduction <coughs> must age. So these are things that are now pretty well established. Selection on age specific rates of survival uh, and reproduction decreases with age. This was an insight that Peter Medawar had. Basically he said that we can see that it's got to be this way because if some portion of the population is dying, there are simply fewer old people around than young people. Okay, I'll, I'll come up with a couple of more ways of expressing that. Just visualize the distribution of your ancestors and trying to take the mean time at which they reproduced. That mean, that mean age at reproduction, when the genes got into the next generation, is going to be dominated by the young, not by the old. And that will be true whether aging exists yet or not. You can do the mental experiment of doing this in a pre-aging population at the origin of life. And uh, you, will, you will find that this has always been true in some sense. So. He saw that even if organisms don't age, there are fewer old than young for some mortality, and often a lot, occurs for reasons that are unrelated to age. Think of it however you wish. Meteorite crashes on your head, you fall off a ladder, whatever. People die for reasons that are not there because they are susceptible to degenerative disease or to increasing susceptibility to pathogens as they get older. They die for reasons that are not controllable by internal physiological readjustment. Now evolution is a numbers game, and that means that selection is operating on the things that happen most frequently. It's stronger on events that happen in the young than on those that happen in the old. Now George Williams added an important genetic effect to this insight. It's called antagonistic pleiotropy. One of the uh, peak performances of Baba Brinkman is that he's actually able to wrap that phrase, antagonistic pleiotropy. It's not easy to wrap. It means that a gene will have a positive effect early in life and a negative effect late in life. And another possibility is that it could be neutral early and negative late, in which case you just have mutation accumulation. Any gene that has a positive effect early and a negative effect late is very probably going to be selected so long as the late effects are not too large. So it can be improving reproductive performance early and creating susceptibility to degenerative disease late. And most of the time, such things will be selected because that's the way fitness is going to be calculated. There's a lot of evidence supporting the existence of genes that have these effects. 
there's not so much for the mutation accumulation. One reason may be that it's actually difficult to find a gene that only is expressed in a narrow range of ages. Genes are usually expressed with effects over much of the lifespan. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. Now, I'm not going to read out every sentence on this slide. You can read the beginning of each sentence if you wish. What I want to get across here is that I'm now going to step through seven different examples, most of which are from my own work, uh, that illustrate different ways of looking at trade-offs. Okay? And just remember, there are going to be seven of them. If Randy cuts me off, I'll accelerate and get through them. Uh, the first two are not yet published. This one is under review right now, and it shows that coronary artery disease is trading off with reproduction. So this is a study uh, done with my participation by a group in Melbourne where we took 76 candidate genes from the biggest meta-analysis of coronary artery disease and then analyzed 12 genomic data sets for significant signals of selection. And we found that 40 out of those 76 genes showed signals of selection. The data sets are worldwide, so these are whole genomes. <laughs> there are Africans and a variety of them. There are East Asians and a variety of them. There are Europeans and a variety of them. And then we have some Gujarati Indians in Houston, some Mexicans in Los Angeles. So the sampling is not exhaustive, but it attempts to be representative. There are a lot of results, and here I'm just emphasizing the trade-offs with reproductive traits. Okay? So the way to read this complicated picture is that here are the 40 genes going down the left. The circles and so forth are showing things that are P values that are calculated from 10,000 per permutations in the data sets. IHS, in other words, how dark it is, is an integrated haplotype score, which is a measure of selection strength, okay? So basically, uh, if it's got a big circle and it's dark, it's significant and it's experiencing selection. And as you look at this, you can see, oh, there is a gene that in all of the populations is both influencing the risk of coronary artery disease and is showing that it's under some selection. So we then take those and we go to the literature and we ask, what do we know about what those genes are doing? And oh my goodness, some of them are affecting potential fertility in males or females, or pregnancy outcomes, or reproductive outcomes, or fetal offspring, or, uh, fetal or offspring mortality. In other words, all of these things that are affecting coronary artery disease and are under selection seem to be doing something else about reproductive performance. And so the evolutionary scenario would look something like this. There's positive selection on traits that are expressed earlier in life that improve fitness, and it's causing trade-offs in coronary artery disease risk that decrease fitness, and that leads to a negative genetic relationship between those early and late life traits. So just the fact that you pick up a signature of selection for a gene that a GWAS has found is correlated with some disease state doesn't mean that the disease is causing the selection. It could very well be operating through this kind of a trade-off. Now, it's interesting that you can do GWAS to identify candidate genes and then detect signals of selection in genes that affect polygenic traits. Okay, so this was done for a total of 40 genes. The evidence of antagonistic pleiotropy makes us nice and comfortable because it fits with the evolutionary theory of aging, and I think maybe discomfort would be more constructive because being comfortable means that you don't really know what to do next. The signals of selection are really more likely to be coming from the early life reproduction than from the late life heart disease. And a take home that will come up again and again now is that this is complicated. There are at least 40 genes involved here and they are having effects on several reproductive traits. <clears throat> Two, second example. Surgical treatment of an immediate infection trades off with the long-term risk of many diseases. 
So in this case, we analyzed the risks of taking out the adenoids, the tonsils, or the appendix in about a million Danes and followed them from birth until they were 30. Okay, so this is because we have access to the central registry for all Danes. Now, the risks did increase for many diseases. So taking out adenoids and tonsils most affected the risks of respiratory and allergic diseases. Perhaps not surprisingly, they are part of our front line of immune defense in the upper respiratory tract. And appendectomy most affected risks of digestive and genitourinary diseases. The only risk that decreased was that if you had your appendix out, you had less risk of inflammatory bowel disease. Otherwise, all the risks went up. And so the benefits of the early life surgeries are trading off with longer term costs in the form of health risks that in aggregate appear to outweigh the immediate benefits. A couple of comments on that. A, pediatricians and ENT people are like all people in medical specialties living in silos and they treat the patient they see in front of them and they don't see them as they grow up. Okay, so they don't get the feedback of the long term consequence. Um, and the other thing is that it's very difficult and quite understandable that a doctor who is faced with a child who has a really bad sore throat might decide, it's, it's hard to say, wait, let's see if it goes away on its own. And in fact, I've talked with my nephew who is an ENT guy who takes out tonsils, and uh, Tim tells me that they now wait for about the third or the fourth infection before they operate, just to see if they can get rid of it without doing that. So they know that it's not a, not a good idea to take out a chunk of the immune system. Complicated picture. Um, here are disease categories on the left. The kind of operation is a red diamond for an appendectomy, a black circle for an adenotomy, an open square for a tonsillectomy, and an open triangle for an adenotonsillectomy. Bonferroni corrections, because there are lots of multiple comparisons here. Anything that's got this little blue point is Bonferroni significant. So there are three panels. You've got relative risk in this panel. You've got absolute risk here and you have number needed to treat over here. Now those of you who are physicians know what number needed to treat means. Those of you who are not need to know that that would be the number of cases that a physician say needed to do, in this case an appendectomy on, before one additional case of digestive ulcers was caused. Okay, and so in this case that's more than 3,000 patients. That's not very important. So. Here, a big number means that it's not very risky, and a small number means, uh-oh, there might be something I need to worry about. These are the measures here. The relative risk is the one that most people are used to interpreting, and usually they are looking to see whether the relative risk crosses the 1.0 line or not, and in many of these cases, it is not. So the thing I want you to get out of this is, oh, you take out the tonsils or the adenoids, Things happen later on, and they happen to many different risks of disease. We're, by the way, we're still calculating the risks on the chronic and degenerative diseases. So uh, just to show you what you can do in Denmark, these are all the things that are controlled for. So this is that list of diseases over here. Those, they form the rows. The columns form all of the other confounding factors that you can measure. So you've got paternal age, maternal age, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of things that you can partial out of the risk estimates. Uh, the nice thing here is that you can see mom had the disorder, dad had the disorder, and most of those are pretty dark, and that shows you that those are the genetic signals, really, or if you like, anything having to do with a family environment coming in. So a data set like that, although it's descriptive, does give you the power to dissect a fair amount. So the take home. Surgery does uncover the benefits of an intact immune system and the costs of, remo of removing it. Not all of those costs had been apparent. Now those are trade-offs occurring within the first third of the life of an individual. This is not across generations or in populations. And they are not directly expressed as benefits and costs to fitness, but rather as risks of disease, immediate and long-term. And 
what matters here for in terms of unintended consequences and unpleasant surprises is not that the relationship between the traits be the classical plus minus trade off, it's just that there is a connection. There are going to be consequences. So it's really more of a statement about the internal connections in organisms than it is about the classical trade off concept. Okay, third. This uh, comes out of the book that I wrote with Ruslan. And the idea here is that there is a way of looking at trade-offs as happening within populations. If you improve function around the center of a distribution, it will trade off with pathologies in the tail. The underlying idea here is that organisms and their traits are built out of complex processes. And they are connected to each other, but each of them can vary. And what that means is that you're going to generate a lot of variation at the level of the trait or the whole organism that will be expressed as a broad range of phenotypes. Evolution may be selecting for the benefits near the mean, but it has to pay the cost of what gets expressed in the tails. So if we put that into a picture, it looks like this. Evolution is worried mostly about the adaptive center where things are highly functional. Not so much about the unavoidable extremes because most of the reproduction is coming through the adaptive center. But if you're in the extreme, you're wondering, oh, why me, oh, Lord? In other words, it might not actually be about you. It might actually be about the distribution of function in the whole population, and you are just unfortunately a byproduct of that process. So the take-homes are that pathology in the focal patient might be the indirect consequence of an evolutionary process operating in the population as a whole. And I'm going to illustrate that with an example, but in order to explain the example, I need to make sure everybody's up to speed on evolutionary conflict. So I'll give a very brief introduction to evolutionary conflict. The parent and the offspring are expected to disagree over how long the parent should invest over how much should be given, and over the behavior the offspring shows towards its siblings and other relatives, because there are asymmetries in relationship. It's expected to increase during the period of parental care, and offspring are expected to use behavior as a psychological weapon in conflict with parents. You all know about that if you have kids. So, during pregnancy, the fetus is expected to extract more from mom than mom is expected to give. Fetal tissue can manipulate maternal physiology via hormone production, also via uh, actual uh, biomechanics of physiology and, and morphology. These manipulations are easier when the tissue invades maternal tissue in the placenta. We are one of the species that has a highly invasive placenta. There are two main ways to increase fetal provisioning. One is to increase maternal blood pressure. When that is overdone, it leads to preeclampsia, which is a life-threatening uh, high blood pressure condition in pregnancy. The other is to increase the sugar concentration of maternal blood, and if that's overdone, that can lead to pregnancy-related diabetes. It gets more complicated than that, however, because there is such a thing as genomic imprinting. And genomic imprinting is where a gene is silenced one way in the mother and the same gene is silenced and left open in the, in, the, in the mother. So one way in the father and the other way in the mother. So the father is turning something off, the mother is leaving on, or the mother is turning off something that the father is leaving on. And it's done in the germline and the genes are then expressed in the offspring. When this is going on, you might wonder why does it happen well, the mother is 50% related to each of her offspring, but if she has future offspring with other males, only this one is 50% related to this father, and the others won't be related to him at all. So there's an asymmetry of interest between mothers, mothers and fathers on average. Don't think of this as just being in humans. This is the whole mammal lineage. Um, and thus, to the degree that mating is polygamous, paternal genes will be selected to extract more from mom than mom, mom is selected to give, and maternal genes will be selected to resist. Well, what's going on here is that dad's turning off 
genes that downregulate growth. So paternally expressed transcripts enhance growth if they're expressed. If they're off, they dampen it. Mom is turning off genes that upregulate growth. Maternally expressed transcripts inhibit growth. The normal state is an equilibrium in which both mom and offspring are in reasonably good condition, so you can think of them as being in the center of that distribution. The conflict is revealed when the action taken by one parent is canceled by disrupting the imprinting. That can be done with mutations or with transgenic mice or with things like that. And in mice, it has been shown that that produces an increase or a decrease of about 10% in birth weight, okay? In humans, similar conditions are produced by rare genetic diseases. I emphasize the word birth, birth weight because we're going to use it now to look at the extension of the hypothesis. So now we're not talking about stuff going on in the placenta. We're talking about genomic imprinting in the brain that affects behavior. And Bernie Crespi and Chris Badcock had the idea that this could help to ex explain autism and schizophrenia. And it's a complicated thing, and it's well worth reading the papers, but I want to get to the trade-off, so I'm just going to say that their idea is that there's a spectrum here from psychosis to autism, and that we expect psychosis to occur where maternal interest is winning, and you have lower birth weight, and we expect autism to occur where paternal interest is out of balance, and you have higher birth weight. Okay. By the way, the, this part of it is to, just to show that there are supposed to be many different things that influence those outcomes, not just this idea. But I wanted to explain why it is that we use birth weight as a proxy for conflicts between genes derived from mother and father. And the bottom line is that we found it does account for a significant amount of risk, but it's only one of several factors and it's not necessarily the biggest. So again, back to Denmark. Here are uh, 1.75 million <coughs> births in Denmark, and these are the birth weights here. You can see these are pretty small tails out here on the distribution. Most of the births are in the center. The height of this bar in the histogram here is 150,000 births in that one histogram. And you can see, the main thing I want you to see is that as you go out towards the tails, you start picking up a lot more mental disorders. And if you're at the center, things are pretty functional. The whole story about the uh, crespi badcock hypothesis is interesting, but in terms of trade-offs, this illustrates a population-level trade-off. Okay? When you start getting way out towards very heavy babies or way out towards very light babies, the percentage of mental disorders is going up dramatically. So population level trade-offs are clearly not why allocations or conflicts over signaling inside a signal or single organism. They are, however, integrated into correlated responses to selection because those are happening at the population level. And they are certainly reminding us that evolution doesn't care about individuals. The focus is on increases in gene frequencies, and that results from the part of the population that reproduces the most, and that's in the center of the frequency distribution. Okay, uh, fourth example. Lifetime reproduction trades off with cancer risk. So in this study, we did a GWAS on the Framingham men and women. So that's the Framingham Heart Study. And we wanted to see if there were any SNPs that correlated with the association between lifetime reproductive success and lifespan. So basically, we're going across the entire genome, and we're looking at the relationship between uh, reproduction, say, on this axis and lifespan on this axis, and we're seeing whether or not the genes are tilting that relationship at all. Well, to do that, you have to have a, some phenotypic thing to base your calculations on. And we did find significant negative phenotypic correlations between children ever born in lifespan in women and in men. And I'll show you a plot in a minute of what that looks like in women. 
the genet interestingly, we applied the, uh, the animal model, which is uh, a method of inferring quantitative genetic parameters um, from large data sets and large pedigrees, and we have large pedigrees. The genetic correlation between children ever born in lifespan and women was significant and uh, strongly negative. It was actually, it's actually minus 0.877. That missed my, edit, missed my editing. There's a minus sign in there. And we found five SNPs that are influencing the relationship, and some are in genes that have been linked to cancer. We didn't find any in men. So the phenotypic relationship is here in the top panel. This is the number of children per lifetime. This is the frequency in the population. And basically what you see here is that having one or two kids is helpful because it's actually decreasing, or it, it's d decreasing your relative mortality risk. But from the third kid onward, your mortality risk is going up. And in fact, the way that works out, if you translate it into years, is that each child from the third onward is taking one year off the life of the mother. It's going from about 85 to 84 to 83 years as you go from three to four to five kids. And this is the GWAS, so this is all, you know, the genomics types will immediately recognize what the columns are and so forth. The point is that there's a SNP near a gene called EOMIS that has a pretty high genomic significance level, and it's associated with the risk of multiple sclerosis and bladder cancer. So it looks like this makes some sense in the evolution of aging kind of context that greater reproduction would be associated with a risk later in life. The take-homes here are that at least in this study, we could quantify the cost of reproduction in women, and it occurred from the third child onward. The fact that this gene was identified as involved in cancer in other studies doesn't mean that cancer is the mechanism that's mediating the effect here. We have to be careful about getting comfortable with that kind of correlation. But it does show a sense in which one can use the word trade-off in the context of a big epidemiological genomics study. Okay, fifth. The gold standard in evolutionary genetics for demonstrating that traits are negatively correlated with each other is a negative correlated response to selection or a negative genetic correlation. The argument being that what really matters in evolution is that you trace consequences through long enough over generations to see that they are reflected in changes in gene frequencies. Now, this next figure that I'm going to show you is probably a summary of the biggest community attempt to do that. It summarizes 14 studies in five labs, about 100 man years of labor. One trait was selected. The correlated responses in the other traits were measured after many generations, varied between labs. And the important thing here is that these correlated responses are integrating across all levels of connections between traits. So there are genetic, epigenetic, physiological, developmental, behavioral, ecological levels of connections between traits. And when you are doing this kind of study, all of those come into play. And you don't see them. You see the outcome. But in most cases, uh, you can't do the study in sufficient detail to essentially take a videotape at all levels of the biological hierarchy and see how all of these things are changing as you select. So here is the result for Drosophila. The boxes are traits. The blue boxes are life history traits. The lighter boxes over there are physiological traits, which were measured in some of the studies. The important thing is to follow an arrow. So if, for example, you see an arrow from early fecundity to late fecundity that starts at early fecundity and ends in late fecundity, it meant that early fecundity was selected up. The response in late fecundity was either zero or negative. And if late fecundity was selected to increase, the response in early fecundity was always down, always negative. And so the picture you get of the organism 
is of an entity that is connected, whose traits are connected by interactions, and that if you change one of them, like developmental time, for example, or body size, or longevity, it sets off a whole set of correlated responses in the other traits. And if you measure, for example, the consequences of increasing late fecundity, you can find that there's a whole set of things that happen at the physiological level that are associated with it. So again, one of the take-homes on this is that selection on one trait is changing several other traits, and that raises the, this, this issue. How many such consequences would we measure if we could easily quantify the phenome? By the phenome, I mean everything, right? These limited number of traits are reduced to that limited number by research considerations and framing of questions that occur in advance. But if you went in theory-free and just said, what kinds of things happen if I pull on X, what else changes? We have no idea how many other things would change. Okay, we just know that several do. The responses we got there are consistent with evolutionary theory of aging. The, evol the evidence is in favor of antagonistic pleiotropy, but it's quite indirect, it's inferred. So there's no direct evidence in that experiment for the mechanisms mediating the trade-off within the individuals and populations. There are some hints in these physiological correlates. Okay, so that's it's not a total black box, but it's certainly not really predictive of how fast things would change. Okay, there are also trade-offs among functions that are mediated by signals. And signals are information rather, well, signals are often in the form of some material stuff. But the important thing about them is that they're conveying information. And hormones, for example, are coordinating functions among tissues. Cytokines are coordinating functions among cells. They're mediating allocations among things like reproduction and maintenance. Many of the trade-offs in energy and materials are regulated by signaling molecules. Other mechanisms are not directly related to energy, things like competition for receptors on cell surfaces and things like that. So what I would like you now to do is just take a moment and insert your favorite example of a complex system of coordinated responses mediated by hormones operating in feedback loops. There are bunches of them out there. We've got the pituitary hypothalamic axis. We've got the sex hormones. We've got the fight or flight response. We've got all kinds of things that we're taught as biologists that are set up in homeostatic systems with, with feedback loops. And then from that, I would like to make a few points. One is that the expression of hormones and their role in integrating function is something that's both mediated by environmental signals and is getting feedback from internal physiological state. So they're playing important roles in phenotypic plasticity and state-dependent responses. So that's a whole realm of biology in which these kinds of trade-offs are very important. And while they're doing their job of controlling these diverse tissues and cells, the hormones are controlled by genes that are embedded in large genetic networks. And so here we have a level of complexity at one level that's hard to parse, underlaid by another level of complexity that's also hard to parse. And we don't have too many people that are looking across both levels of complexity. So there's a complexity center at Arizona State, and if they want to take a look at how complex hormonal interactions interact with complex genetic networks, more power to them. Now, if there are multiple set points in a system like that, dysregulation can produce a pathology. That would include diabetes and obesity. So that's also a trade-off cost, and it's pay paid in the tails of a population distribution, but it's a cost which is expressed in terms of risk of diabetes and obesity. And because of the number of side effects you get from manipulating a hormone, the potential for unintended consequences is great. And in fact, I think that the endocrinological profession understands this very well. And any of you who have been in treatment for hormones knows that your doctor is usually very conservative about changing dose. And they do it slowly and in small steps because they're worried about what might happen. The web of interactions in these signaling networks, 
can be liberated by duplicating an entire module, and that has happened in evolution. It's fairly rare, but it does happen that an entire module will get duplicated. Or it can be rewired by changing the distribution of receptors and gene cells and tissues, which is probably something that happens more frequently at a microevolutionary level. But I am frankly uh, puzzled by the degree to which hormones can influence so many different things at once and why that can then produce costs that haven't been better minimized or better focused, let us say. I'm sure that a lot of that has already gone on and they have been well focused by evolution to a certain extent, but I'm puzzled by the why it's not more precise. So the final look at what is a trade-off is in transcriptomics. And uh, remember, I'm flashing through a series of examples, and what I'm doing is I'm just trying to build up in your minds a catalog of different ways people have looked at this term. So here the hypothesis is that a trade-off is caused by a conflict among functions over the expression of many genes and many pathways. And that would mean backing off and using kind of a genomics approach to looking at trade-offs. And if you want to test a hypothesis like that, it will take at least two steps. One is you have to measure the whole organisms of functions, uh, whole organism functions of genes, to assess conflicts among functions. If you go into a gene ontology database, most of what you see is inside cells. It's not at the whole organism level. And rather than wait for people to do the whole genotype phenotype map, I think that we can jump over that and simply look at whole organism functions in challenge experiments and look at the way the transcriptome changes as organisms are challenged and use that to say, okay, operationally, this is what the function is of that set of genes. And then you could validate this concept of trade-off by testing its ability to predict the classical correlated response, okay? So now there might be a lot more that goes into a correlated response than agreement or conflict over gene expression. So this might not be uh, accounting for all of the correlated response, but unless it can account for some of it, then it's not really a very good concept. So the logic of the central hypothesis is you've got function A over here, might be cold resistance, you've got function B over there, might be uh, immune performance against pathogen challenge or something like that. The conflict occurs in the gray spaces where you want one to be up and the other down. And a major conflict would mean if, this, if the big white square is the transcriptome of the whole genome, you might have a major conflict if a lot of the genome is involved in things that are in conflict over those two functions. And a minor conflict would be, oh, just a very small part of the genome is involved in that. Well, this is what we're up against. Here is the genetic regulatory network inferred from gene expression in yeast. This is from Paul Mag Magwine. And what it shows you is a puzzling, complex network of interconnections among different kinds of functions. And this is, not, this is now from gene ontology connections, okay? This isn't from organismal challenge experiments. But it gives you some idea of the kind of thing that we confront. And so the take home there is that we get involved in a whole new level of complexity. It's not yet clear how best to connect that to whole organism integration. And the pious hope that with sufficient data, clarity will emerge, is not likely to be fulfilled, okay? We need a model of science in which people with creative insights simplify things. In other words, I don't trust putting this into the hands of bioinformatics is going to result in deep conceptual advance. I think it's going to result in high paper output. <laughs> so having gone through that, first I'm going to pose a few general questions, and then I'll wrap up. What are the processes that shape the modules out of which organisms get built? What sets the limits to the universality of epistasis and pleiotropy? That will determine the framework within which trade-offs do or do not occur. Do they only exist within modules and not among them? Or are there no modules that are independent? The answer would shed a lot of light on how we define modules and traits. 
To what extent can compensatory evolution reduce the costs imposed by trade-offs? Can they be delayed until after death, death occurs for other reasons? In other words, one of the cheapest ways to uh, reduce the cost of a trade-off is buy now, pay later. And in fact, we have evidence that Drosophila does exactly this. In fact, that trade-offs that are where the benefits are realized in reproduction on the first day of life are not paid in costs in terms of mortality until the 40th day of life. So they've managed to put that off until they're probably mostly dead anyway. Must every correlated response to, be, to selection be underpinned by a Y allocation physiological response, however it is genetically influenced? I don't think it must, but it's often assumed that they are that that's the main thing going on. If you want to predict the dynamic response of a trade-off under selection, do you have to know the underlying mechanism, or is it enough to just measure the genetic covariance phenotypically? Uh, the problem with measuring the genetic covariance is, is that your estimates change as selection proceeds. <laughs> So it's not clear. It's probably going to give you a first cut, but I don't think it's going to give you good prediction out beyond 10 generations. Do the complex trade-offs in multicellular eukaryotes like us, involving conflicts in transcriptomes, have properties that are fundamentally different from a zero-sum Y allocation trade-off that might involve, for example, two roles for a single molecule produced by a virus? That's a really clean logical system, that, that virus molecule. It can only do one function or the other, and there's a finite number of them. That's clear. Does that mean that when that sort of trade-off is involved in determining some evolutionary optimum, that it's qualitatively different from what we might expect from, an, from another mechanism? We don't know. Does compensatory evolution to reduce the costs of trade-offs, which is something that evolution will always try to do, increase the complexity of connections to the point where it causes embedding and constraint? In other words, if you think back to that picture of the transcriptome of a yeast cell, if there have been trade-offs between two traits that are causing costs, then a modifier gene could arise that will reduce the cost, but it will then be trading off with another thing. And then a modifier will arise to reduce that cost, and it will be trading on with, off with another thing. And you do that for 3.8 billion years. Does that mean that you are generating a system that is constrained in its potential responses? I don't think that we have yet done enough experimental evolution to know. So two research suggestions. The first is basic. Does the rate at which a trade-off evolves depend on the complexity of the genetic network that influences it? It is possible now to do experimental evolution in systems with simpler and more complex genetic networks, so that could be approached. The second one is more applied. Which of the trade-offs that are involved, involved in the vulner vulnerabilities of aging have the fewest predicted potential side effects when they're perturbed, and which have the most? Now, that would suggest studies in model systems and in clinics of what trade-offs can tell us about anti-aging therapies and vice versa. And since anti-aging therapies are becoming both of great interest to the aging human population and to the corporate boards of big pharma, um, I think that the second one is actually a really pressing research interest. And we want to know whether or not we are likely to do more harm than good when we try to keep people alive longer. There's so much emphasis now on having an, ex an extension of our healthy lifespan that this becomes critical. So in conclusion, trade-offs are involved in most of the fundamental mechanisms that determine health and disease. Evolution will tolerate high costs and big risks when the benefits are large. The greater the benefit, the more likely it is that a perturbation of a trade-off will uncover a nasty side effect and I note that the benefits of reproduction are great. Every therapy perturbs a trade-off. We seem to have been getting away with quite a bit without knowing that we were. And we can only anticipate the consequences of perturbations with confidence if we understand mechanisms that mediate the trade-offs. And at this point, we're far from being able to do so. Thank you very much. So much, Steve. We are going to ask people to use this microphone, even though it doesn't amplify, so that people watching the video can hear the questions. 
Who's first? I have left you in a state of depression and shock. <laughs> I have a question about these mystical compensatory kind of yeah. <laughs> mutations or so. I mean, we've, we studied like species trait differences and see often if you look that there is kind of a, a large gene effect, small, medium, and it kind of pales off. So it kind of follows what you predict that immediately if you have a new trait coming, as an analogy to your, to your trade in the action. There's a, a QDL or a gene which changes very quickly, has a large effect on the trade, and then you often see three, four, five, which diminishing record. Would you say that is a kind of an supporting your idea? I would say it belongs to that large category of data that are consistent with a certain theoretical interpretation, but where necessity and sufficiency is not yet established. <laughs> And I would therefore remain agnostic. I'm uh, kind of tough nut on that one. Jim. So, so Steve, nice talk. Thank you. Um, it, so as they say, it's complicated, huh? A lot, there's a lot going on here. What, 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 do you, what would you see as the root in, potentially, to, to, to a general theory as far as trade-offs are concerned? Because you seem to say there we don't have a good root in in terms of mechanism. I think you're. I think you were suggesting that. So, do you see sort of a way to to pull this complexity together? Yeah, um, I do. I think the first one is to consider the possibility that we just call different things by different names, so that we realize in our language that we're talking about different things a bit more. And I haven't decided the best way on that. As I said, this is an interim report from an ongoing project. Um, I think one of the ways in is to ask uh, which are, what are the characteristics of trade-offs that allow them to be changed rapidly and what are the ones that force them to be only changed slowly and to concentrate on that. I think another way to into it is to bring more system science into evolutionary biology to try to understand whether there are general features of systems that have certain kinds of connections in them that have certain kinds of consequences and see whether that's related in biological systems. Um, you know, back when we were just doing like optimi optimizing life histories, it didn't actually matter what the mechanisms were. And in fact, I can remember being attacked by a member of my PhD committee on the issue of why aren't you worried more about physiological mechanisms and me just to miss dismissing him out of hand because I wanted to get to the other thing and I didn't want to be slowed down by the mechanisms. And all I needed to know was plus minus at that point. But we've gone far beyond that now. And the concept has been applied now in contexts where it's starting to have real-world consequences. And there, things like how many traits are actually affected and how fast and how big are the effects start becoming really important. And that's why I've been motivated to kind of back up and take a new look at it. Um, in one sense, I suppose, uh, the, way out, the, the, easy, the easy way out, but maybe also the most realistic way out for me in answering your question is to let the sociology of science do its usual bit and have 100 different research groups try 100 different things and the ones that strike pay dirt will be remembered and the ones that don't will be forgotten. But I think that we need a new way, basically I'm saying something that a lot of other people have said in other contexts, we need to figure out how to simplify the genotype-phenotype map. And we're not going to do it with bioinformatics. We're going to do it with people who have creative ideas of how to build general models of the intermediate structure of organisms. It's a tough nut. It's not easy. But uh, it's very important. And we need to wrap up. Thank you so much, Steve.